I'm Paul Brody. I'm the Global Blockchain Leader. I am delighted to be here today. Um, I thought that I was going to have to kick off our event today with a bunch of stale jokes about how this is once again a clothing optional event because we are um, we are, are back in uh, some degree of, of virtual instead of being able to do some things live. The good news is the collapse in crypto markets has supplied a much more entertaining vein of, of news. In fact, my personal favorite from Twitter yesterday was the joke that um, things are so bad now in the metaverse that people are considering work to earn instead of play to earn. Wah, wah, I know. Uh, I tested this on my husband last night. He didn't think it was funny, but he, uh, he once said to me, honey, I'm having trouble sleeping. Can you explain how blockchains work again? So I don't know if he's the best test market. What I do wanna to talk to you today about is uh, how the blockchain ecosystem is changing because it is changing. It's changing a great deal. And in particular, I believe that we are in a transition in the market from kind of this search for the killer applications to the mass adoption phase. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty old and I've, I've lived through a couple of these like big ups and downs in the marketplace. This is my second crypto roller coaster round. And uh, I was around, I was in tech in 1999 to 2001 and again in 2006 to 2008. And the key takeaway for me on all of this is it's important to separate um, the technology adoption cycle, right? What are people starting to use? When are they using it? Why are they using it from any particular asset price? And in fact, if you go back, whether it's to 2001 or to 2008 or 2009, what's really remarkable at that, about that time period is the degree to which technology adoption, the growth of e-commerce, mobile networking, that rocketed upwards entirely independently of speculative asset prices. And so what I'm gonna talk about today, I just really wanna focus on the fact that I am talking about the adoption of a technology ecosystem and the creation of a business ecosystem, not any particular expectations or, or performance of particular assets. So with that, let me get into the talk, which I think is, is, is gonna be, I hope it's gonna be very interesting. And, and if it isn't, we'll see that in the number of people who are watching just sort of drops like a rock. Um, so uh, I titled this, this presentation, 2022 is the end of the beginning, because we have been in kind of the beginning phase of the blockchain and crypto ecosystem for several years now, probably about a decade, right? And it started with kind of the invention of this technology. Uh, we had this kind of initial boom when people started to realize how incredibly powerful and valuable it is. And then we had a bit of a bust when people realized it's actually going to be a lot harder than we thought it was going to be to make this stuff work the way we would like it to work, right? And then we went through this uh, uh, kind of crypto winter, this difficult time period. And now we're back in a mode where we have a chance to talk about uh, and, and work on the things that are all about scaling, right? We have killer applications and we are now shifting from finding the right applications that drive adoption to this mass adoption period. And consequently, I believe the rules of the game have to a large degree change. What do I mean by that? Where are we headed? Let's talk about that. So uh, first of all, let's talk about where the market is. So I believe that kind of technology markets go through about five kind of cycles, right? So they have this kind of early adoption surge where people get excited about te technology. And then you go through this difficult period where adoption slows down, right? And that's because we're start searching for the useful business application. And when we find the useful business application, it's a bit of an inflection point. It's a little bit like when uh, cloud storage came out, right? We have been searching, I think, to some degree for a, a understanding of what is, the, what is the, the right business application that launches this board. And now I think we have three, which I'll talk about in a moment. And that takes you usually into this mainstream adoption period. And mainstream adoption is, it can be you know, 10, 15 years, 20 years, where growth is very, very consistent. It's about scale. And finally, you work through the, the middle, early adopters, the middle adopters, you end up in the late adopters. By the way, I think this is about a 25 year cycle. For consumer products, it can be shorter, but I think especially in spaces that, that involve enterprises and governments, these are not super fast cycles. They actually can take quite a long time. Now we have, I believe, we've got some really incredible applications that are driving this market. Right. First and foremost, cryptocurrencies and non-fungible tokens, these are in, they are rapidly approaching what I would call saturation in the sense that, you know, two or three years from now, everybody who wants ETH 
or Bitcoin or an NFT, we'll easily be able to buy it and find them. The next thing that, that's coming right behind that is decentralized finance, DeFi. It is on this kind of rocket ride upwards. And I think in the long run, it will ultimately have a much, much bigger impact than NFTs because we are creating this kind of vast programmable business ecosystem. And then finally, decentralized autonomous organizations. Those are really just getting started. They are a new way of setting up, running, funding, and operating a business. And they are going to be absolutely transformational over time as companies and organizations uh, change the way they do business. So uh, DAOs are really just starting to ramp up. We're seeing qu quite a lot of that. But the big drivers are cryptocurrencies and non-fungible tokens and DeFi. How big is a driver? It's very substantial, right? These two technologies, these two kind of use cases have been pulling users in uh, to a very large degree over the last few years. The DeFi ecosystem is about $300 billion in value, right? And NFT sales, they've gone up, they've gone down, but there seem to be around at the moment about $500 million a day. That's a lot, right? $300 billion is a lot when you look at where it was a couple of years ago. Now, the other thing that you should probably be taking away from looking at this map, especially the one around DeFi, is that this seems like a very crowded market with a lot of different ecosystems in there. And you're right. If you look at the picture of blockchain ecosystems, it looks confusing. There is a lot of churn. It seems like there's a million different platforms to choose from. Some of them are new, some of them are old, slightly bigger, slightly smaller. When you step back, however, I want to argue that in fact, the market has largely chosen and the market has chosen Ethereum and the Ethereum ecosystem as the dominant platform, right? And I, I will make this argument that what we are seeing with this profusion of other platforms is something that tends to happen in every technology cycle, but it doesn't usually change the outcome once you have a platform that's so dominant. And Ethereum represents 70% of the DeFi capital, 95% of the NFT sales, and you know, depending on who you talk to, at least between three and 10 times more application developers than any other ecosystem. And by the way, I would argue the application developer metric is the one that really, really matters in the long run, right? Now, this looks really similar, and I, I wanna give a hat tip to my good friend, Horace DeGio over at Simco, to what happened in the PC market early on. Now, I am very, very old. So I personally own some of these early devices, um, but the PC market was interesting because uh, personal computing kind of exploded in the late 1970s and the early 1980s uh, when I at least was a relatively small kid. And what's amazing about this market and what's really interesting is um, early on, it looks very crowded, right? And, and it looks super crowded. And you can see here in the dark blue line is the PC line. And, um, people continued, even after it started to look like PCs were really taking off, they kept launching new platforms. They kept saying to themselves, I can do something better than the PC. And, and you have to remember that, that in the early days of personal computing, the kind of standard Windows PC was an awful experience, right? It was very easy and compelling to argue that uh, the Commodore Amiga, the Apple Macintosh, the Atari ST, they were all much better much, much better experiences for the money. And yet strangely, uh, users, corporate buyers, enterprises, look for this issue of efficacy. How well does it work for my particular use case rather than is it in general a, a really great experience? And again, if you step back, even though the market looks crowded in reality, the PC came to really, really dominate that ecosystem. And I would argue that it, it's still, uh, a, a, the same kind of ex ecosystem going on. And I, I could pull out, I could spend the rest of the discussion, I could pull out the charts from the mobile era as well. Nearly the same thing happened. Um, and, and, and by the way, the other thing I want you to store in the back of your heads is that 30 years later, and we are here 30 years later, it's still the same market. Worldwide, Windows PCs represent something like 90% of all personal computing sales. So, I believe the market has changed. I believe the market has chosen Ethereum. I believe that maybe it's not perfect, but scalability concerns are being addressed by the rise of layer two networks. 
right? Uh, Polygon, Arbitrum, Optimism, just to name a few, right? The ecosystem can handle what used to be about a million to 2 million transactions a day, now looks like it can handle something order of 20 million a day, right? So there's plenty of capacity, right? And, and I will I'll showcase a, a particular example of this. We sent out at EY, we decided not to send holiday cards. Instead, we sent NFTs. We sent out 8,000 NFTs over the holidays, for the less than the cost that postage would have been, right? So six months or nine months ago, we would have been worried about, hey, $30 per transaction or $50 a transaction on Ethereum, that's a problem. Two or three cents on a Polygon layer two, no problem at all. So is it the most perfect way to scale an ecosystem? No, does it work? Yes, it brings to mind in my experience, and again, I'm dating myself terribly, it brings to mind in my experience what people talked about with like extended memory in Windows. Uh, the solution to make Windows computers more capable was kind of an ugly mess, but it worked. Um, the Ethereum ecosystem itself is demonstrating a lot of process maturity that you would like to see when you think about what I need from essential infrastructure. And in particular, we don't notice it much, but Ethereum every three months has been deploying a significant hard fork. And each one of those is well reviewed, well tested. The Ethereum Foundation oversees an ecosystem of incredibly boring standards committees that resemble the IETF. And they're boring, but they offer something like institutional maturity. They give people a chance to be heard. They give it a chance to test, think through, and prioritize uh, different um, kind of transformations. So it's demonstrating kind of scalability from an institutional standpoint that we would like to see when we think about where are we going to trust our capacity. So one more thing I want to talk about in market ecosystems is how networks mature. So if we go back to the early days of the internet, it was fantastic in connecting all these different kinds of networks. And there used to be an absolute alphabet soup of networks, token ring, XNA, SNA, DECnet, Netware, Vines, X.25. There used to be a ton of them. And the internet it's called the internet because it connected up all of those different networks, right? And the, the internet protocol was TCP IP, Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol. But what happened over time was really interesting. Eventually, all those other networks kind of faded away. The internet today is basically one giant TCP IP network that connects lots of other IP networks, right? And so I think if history repeats itself, um, layer one is going to be Ethereum, and so are layer twos, right? All the layer twos are basically going to be variations on Ethereum in the same way that all, all people's private networks are just kind of private IP networks. All right, let's talk about if we agree, and I know not everybody does, but if you agree that the market has changed, right, then what are the new rules of the market? How does this change? And I would argue, first and foremost, we're shifting from which platform to which use case, right? And uh, what's notable here is that we are now in kind of the use case race, right? We're starting, if you go back to the personal computing, we started with office productivity and somehow we ended up with music and gaming and, and uh, presentations. The internet, we started with email and web browsing, we ended up with shopping and social media, right? And all kinds of other services. Blockchain is gonna be the same. We started with cryptocurrencies, then we got to you know, altcoins and colored coins and initial coin offerings. And then we got into DeFi and DAOs. So it'll be a use case journey. And that journey is very, very far from over. Now, at the heart of the use case journey, I believe, especially early on, is NFTs, cryptocurrencies, and DeFi. And at least here at EY, we have some perspective about how these use cases are likely to evolve. So I would say, in my opinion, we are close to a couple of years, two to three years away from what I might call market saturation for cryptocurrencies and NFTs. That doesn't mean that people will stop buying them. It just means that that sort of explosive growth and saturation is, is gonna reach that point. DeFi and stable coins, we are still, I think, in the acceleration phase. The market is maturing. We're waiting, by the way, for a lot of regulatory clarity that will unlock a huge amount of, of institutional capital and, and innovation. Uh, and I think we will see kind of really rapid acceleration of mainstream uh, uh, DeFi usage in about 2023 or early 2024. So maybe another 12 to 18 months of 
churning and trying to find the right mix of products and services that are regulatory compliant. Supply chain traceability, I think roughly the same uh, pace, right? Um, this year is gonna be an incredibly important for supply, year for supply chain. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. And then kind of, I think further down, if, if we look at kind of how things are starting and we, we always get this kind of interesting trickle uh, at EY, we start with uh, startups coming to us and saying, hey, can we talk about a particular technology or a particular use case? And they're struggling to find a couple of pioneer clients. And then we get some early adopters working with us on particular technology or, or, or solution. And then it starts to ramp up. And as it ramps up, it works its way to the level where it's material for our clients and it shows up in audits. And I would say based on this stream of stuff we're seeing, business contracts and payments, embedded financing with supply chain uh, in its early stages and integrated, and the emphasis on integrated tax and compliance starting to, to ramp up, which is a particularly complex one and a particularly challenging one because especially for that, you need not just governments to set the regulatory rules, but you also need them to uh, um, apply some of their own technology and data into that ecosystem. So there's a lot of stuff coming that's predictable. What I would argue though, is that uh, this evolution is going to be relatively rapid and it's gonna contain some significantly unpredictable elements. Right. And again, if we go back to the internet and I love a good historical analogy, um, digital building blocks were the foundation of a lot of kind of uh, the modern services that we depend upon. And the first thing that we did with digital building blocks is do very predictable things. We did online stuff. We did offline stuff online, right? We took catalogs and we turned them into websites, right? We took maps and we turned them into map sites. And from those predictable results, we kind of mixed them up a little bit. We, we, we went one step further and we said, okay, if I sort of match these things together, I can start to do things like crowdsourcing and maps and, and I can have guided directions and maybe ride hailing, right? And if I can do ride hailing, then maybe I can also do things like food delivery services. And so you get into this kind of what I'll call the accelerating disruptions where the online version is better than what existed previously, not just comparable. And finally, you get into the stuff that is genuinely surprising. Right. One of my personal favorites is kind of the rise of these ghost kitchens. Um, I think it was actually recently announced, for example, that TikTok is going to build a set of kitchens that will sell and connect into delivery all the recipes that are advertised or really kind of go viral on TikTok. That is something no one could have predicted because it would be hard to explain to somebody five or 10 years ago what a 60 second video app is, or even get them to conceive of, of a network infrastructure that could handle millions of people flicking through videos like that, right? DeFi is in particular going to be, I think a big engine of this creativity. And it is in my mind, turning into a real competitive infrastructure compared to the existing financial services industry. So if you think of what I think of as traditional transaction-centric banking approach, and I, I don't like calling it TradFi or, 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 or um, uh, CFi, but think of it as transaction-centric, is at least how I do, and sort of token-centric or, or sort of blockchain native, there is innovation going in both directions and competition going in both directions as well, right? So you've got your token-centric organizations that are busy applying for banking licenses, Right? They want to deliver their products and services uh, to people in a regulatory compliant way and unlock that institutional capital. And then you've got all the banks in turn doing a couple of things. Number one, they want to offer their existing customers crypto assets. But I think potentially in the long run, even more importantly, they want to take all of those existing assets, turn them into tokens, make them programmable and deploy them into the DeFi ecosystem and give their customers access to the DeFi ecosystem, mind you, probably curated access, but access nonetheless. And uh, one of my predictions for last year, which I guess I'm gonna renew for this year, is that we will see the first existing financial institution or FinTech, not just offer crypto to their customers, but offer them a, an initial curated selection of DeFi services as well. What's the engine of all of this kind of explosive use case innovation? It's the permissionless nature of blockchain ecosystems, right? So the decentralization really means you are on a level and fair, fair playing field. And the interoperability means you don't have to build everything yourself. You can use 
stuff that's created by others. And what's really exciting about that is that that is combined with the permissionless nature of the ecosystem. You don't need to ask permission to use most of the core technologies out there in the blockchain ecosystem. And that has a, a really powerful effect because it means that you can build new and iterative functionality rapidly. And I wanna illustrate this in a really interesting way. So uh, I didn't put any slides together on this, but um, over the last few months, there's been some market share battles between a couple of the decentralized exchanges. And the interesting thing about competition in a blockchain-based ecosystem is your core software is open source, right? I can look at your solution and I can understand what is better about your solution. Now, I can't necessarily copy it exactly, but I can understand it unless you have a patent on a particular method. And by the way, having applied for quite a few patents and now having a couple myself, I know that's not easy. Usually by the time you get your patent in this industry, uh, the market has moved. But if I can see what's going on, I can tweak it and improve it. And we're seeing that in some of these uh, exchanges to the point where people are, are competing by moving prices down by basis points, right? And they're getting to very low basis points. And I, I saw one case where uh, two different DEXs swapped market share like 80, 20, 20, 80 in the space of a couple months based on that. Competition is gonna be fast and it's potentially quite intense because it's gonna be very hard to kind of hard to hide your secret sauce. And there's gonna be maybe fewer, potentially quite a lot fewer uh, stickiness especially in the fully decentralized components of the ecosystem. The other area where I think it's gonna be a really big year beyond finance is supply chain. So historically, traceability has been easy to do in blockchain ecosystems. It works really well because you can take a product, you can turn it into a token, and then you can track that token as it moves to the ecosystem. Now, the problem that we have had historically is that digital tokens uh, don't come with privacy. And so uh, digital tokens don't come with privacy. And what that means is that you can't be sure exactly, uh, you don't wanna share on a public blockchain how much stuff is done. So you can, you can tokenize a batch, but nobody knows how much is in a batch, for example. This year, we are going to see a bunch of different solutions really delivering for the first time scalable cost-effective privacy. And when you add that to the ecosystem, you get the ability to do not just like, tell me what the history was, but operational data, right? I can now tokenize and manage my inventory across the network. And that's gonna be transformational. We have our first clients that are getting ready to do that. Uh, I think it's gonna be a game changer this year in terms of enterprise usage of blockchain ecosystems, because now you don't need one thing for traceability and another for, for inventory management you can have the same system blockchain do both. And when you've tokenized all your assets, you can start to do other things like borrow against your inventory because it's represented as a digital token. And that too will eventually get plugged into the DeFi ecosystem. Regulatory uncertainty is relatively high right now, but I am fundamentally an optimist. Regulators are going to regulate. And I think in this case, that's going to be a really good thing. In particular, uh, I think that the big focus, the intense focus around stable coins, monetary kind of you know, policy and central bank digital currencies is gonna bring us this year to a round of clarifying regulations. We've seen this uh, here in the UK, we're seeing it in the US. There's a lot of movement, not only towards central bank digital currencies, but I think more importantly, towards the clarity and regulation of stable coins, which are the engine of the entire DeFi ecosystem. In particular, CBDC pilots, which are out there, and there are a lot of them, I think are going to actually accelerate the regulation and the maturity of, of uh, stable coins because people are gonna discover, they are discovering how difficult this is to do. And most of these are going to be somewhat disappointing. And they're disappointing for a variety of reasons, but fundamentally the problem is First of all, all of these stable coins are centrally, uh, these CBDCs are centrally managed. They don't come with privacy guarantees, right? But most importantly, they're not programmable. And programmability is the whole point of stable coin that I can take that and I can insert it into a, uh, a DeFi ecosystem. And if you look at any of the stable coins that have been delivered so far, 
I can't use them in any DeFi ecosystem because not only not programmable, none of them are on a public blockchain. So I think uh, central banks are realizing that CBDCs may come to maturity one day in the future, but in the meantime, uh, if they care about uh, uh, kind of uh, the ecosystem security, it will be good to also regulate the stable coin industry. Now, I wanna have one final word on what it means to mature an ecosystem, because I think uh, we tend to get overly focused on, can I do something better? But actually most early adopters, most users just think about, can I do what I want to do? Or how do I do what I want to do? And one of the interesting consequences of that in the use case phase is that people may start doing things that don't seem very good. And I'll give you a little bit of an example. In the early stages of each technology ecosystem, there's usually a really good match between the kind of core application and the initial functionality of the, the infrastructure. So the internet was a packet-based data network, right? Didn't care where your packets went, didn't care how they came around, just it was good at packing stuff together. And that worked perfectly for web pages and email and transferring data, right? Blockchains are great for digital tokens and programmable money. You know, you can do some really amazing stuff with tokenization and cryptocurrencies and, and protocols and DAOs. What's interesting though about the internet is that as the internet matured, it took on a kind of a different uh, uh, glow in the minds of entrepreneurs, which was to say, everybody had access to the internet. And in those cases, we started putting on the internet use cases that weren't necessarily optimal. You would never design the internet for music and video distribution or telephone calls because the internet doesn't have any quality of service infrastructure, but it does work. And, and this leads to two things. Number one, suboptimal use cases that are still good because everyone's got you know, an internet device in their pocket. And number two, the creation of specialized infrastructure like content delivery networks and MPLS network infrastructure. So that happened on the internet. I think we'll see the same thing happening in the blockchain ecosystem. What happens when tens of millions of people and corporations have Ethereum wallets and they have money in their Ethereum ecosystem, they're gonna do stuff. They're gonna say, hey, I have stuff to sell. I have investment opportunities. I'm gonna build that. And by the way, since it's not optimal for an Ethereum ecosystem, I'm therefore gonna build some specialized infrastructure to support that. So I think that's an evolution that we can see in the future. All right, let me take a few minutes here to wrap up. Uh, and let me lastly close on this question of how to play and how to think ahead. Firstly, on the topic of how to play, uh, there's, a, there's a, an expression they talk about a lot at Amazon and I've shamelessly stolen this from them because it, it's so good. There is no compression algorithm for experience. Uh, I will say this over and over again, um, doing is the only way to really understand how this works. And we have been doing this at EY for, I think I'm now in my seventh year uh, or just approaching my seventh year here since 2015. We have been developing and running applications and it has been brutal and has been difficult. And we have learned a lot of really tough lessons. And so I really wanna say there's just no compression algorithm uh, uh, for experience. It, there's, there's no way to beat that, you've gotta do it. Um, no matter how many white papers you read, nothing beats it, right? Secondly, we see some mistakes over and over again. And I, when I, I see them, I sigh because by the way, we, we fight the same battles. It's been a struggle for us as well. Um, but they are uh, kind of three ones I see over and over again. First of all, it's um, people saying, hey, what's the right platform? The right platform is Ethereum or an Ethereum layer two. Anything else, the chances are you're going off uh, uh, in the wrong direction. I would tell you, if you were building PC software today or phone software today, you wouldn't say, hey, what's the best of all possible mobile platforms? No, say, which are the ones that people have the most, right? That's number one. Number two, stop benchmarking your legacy competition, right? Uh, if you say, hey, I'm a bank and I think I'm doing great in the blockchain ecosystem because I look at my other bank competitors, my traditional competitors and think I'm doing better than them, wrong benchmark. Same conversation that we have, by the way, at EY, right? When somebody says, oh, look at such and such accounting firm, we are doing so much better than them. My answer is, I don't care, right? And then lastly, kind of the risk of doing is now less than the risk of not doing, right? So if you don't do, that's a, a much, much bigger risk. And we try very hard to follow that advice ourselves. 
We have built out our own business in five major chunks, assurance, right? Financial statement audit and other services, consulting, tax advice. And then one that I'm especially proud of and is a big departure for EY, applications, right? Building core technology applications and doing true research. And by research, I don't mean writing white papers. I mean engineers doing mathematical research for blockchain technology. From a technology standpoint, we've consolidated onto a single platform, which is blockchain.ey.com. If you haven't ever been there, go take a look. Uh, we have user interfaces, APIs, continuously running SaaS applications, and we're starting to get multiple products. We've migrated all of our technology for blockchain into this ecosystem, and we're starting to integrate those tools and switch them on for general availability. Two years ago, we had just our first program item. Right. Today, we have almost all of our core technologies there, and more and more of them are in what I would call the generally available category. Blockchain Analyzer, Reconciler, our financial statement technology is by far our most mature. It's currently in, I think, its fourth or fifth iteration. Uh, that business is growing phenomenally, and it's being driven by the fact that we have the ability to automate large chunks of the financial statement audit process, uh, and it will scale. It will allow us to scale our business in this space very substantially. We're also, I hope later this year, gonna start offering some of our blockchain analytics tools that we use for audit to our non-audit clients for their own uh, analytics and management purposes. Ops chain, supply chain management, contract management, uh, it's all about automating business processes. Our flagship use case is Microsoft, that's just been scaling along for multiple years now, 99% reduction in cycle time, right? 40% reduction in cost, and basically 100% reduction in misunderstandings across the members of the ecosystem. We're incredibly proud of that progress. One of the things that I'm especially proud of, and is a sign of kind of the maturity of our process, is the 8,000 New Year card NFTs that we delivered uh, through OpsChain, right? Uh, we did it start to finish. From the idea that we had at the beginning of December in about three weeks, one of my colleagues in Switzerland, Darko Stefanowski, sent me an email and said, Paul, we're about to send a whole bunch of Christmas cards and maybe we should do that as NFTs instead. And in the space of, I wanna say, less than three weeks, we, had, we decided, first of all, we decided we should do New Year's instead of Christmas so we could do it globally. We had an EY art competition. Um, we designed a whole user interface so that people who don't have an Ethereum wallet know how to get one or can get one. We set up a whole bunch of security practices and we executed the entire thing on Polygon, as I said, for less than the cost of postage, right? I don't think we could have done that even six months ago, but we reached a level of maturity in our infrastructure and our technology stack that we can do that uh, and it works well and it works at scale. And I'm just incredibly proud of the engineering team that's made that possible. And then finally, I wanna highlight one of the things I'm also really proud of, it's our smart contract testing solution. We've been investing in this for several years. Fundamentally, smart contracts on public blockchains mean that you move money automatically, right? You are giving that contract the authority to move your money and your assets. And honestly, you should really understand what it is likely to do before you click the digital signature button. And for that reason, I believe it's really important to have the ability to test and simulate those transactions. And so what we have been able to do over the last couple of years is build a true transaction simulation and testing technology. You can build standard tests, you can build custom tests, you can share them around. And most importantly, you can simulate everything you do before you deploy contracts or execute transactions. And I, I hope and I believe that over time, because the vast majority of blockchain users are not software developers, this will become an essential tool and it will have different iterations. There'll be some that are very technical and there'll be some that are kind of quite simple and give people a kind of red, yellow, green, kind of measurement. Lastly, wanted to just take a moment to talk about Polygon Nightfall, which I'm also really proud of. We have spent much of the last five years developing and investing in privacy because we believe it is the key use case for enterprises. The enterprises must have privacy in order to really take advantage of blockchain ecosystem. And so we've been developing this technology called Nightfall and we keep putting it into the public domain, right? We're now in our sort of third iteration. We spent a lot of time developing it. We've developed a, a, a kind of um, regulatory compliance variants. We developed uh, a bunch of other auditability tools for it. And what's so exciting is that we're now working with Polygon, which is the top layer two, and they are going to be setting up 
a layer two network that's focused on privacy uh, called Polygon Nightfall. That network is currently in beta test on the Ethereum uh, public blockchain. So that's kind of, I feel like that's a huge endorsement of our technology investment. Now, just to put a little context, we've been working at this since 2017. Uh, we showed our first version in 2018. So this is hardly an overnight process, but it's been a, a monumental investment of our time and energy uh, over the years. Whew. I know I'm uh, a little bit hyperactive. I've had a fairly large amount of coffee this morning. Hopefully, uh, most of you are still with me. I wanna just finish up with one last thought, which is I wanna try to explain why whether it's inside of EY or in my interactions with the clients, I feel such an immense sense of urgency. And I feel an immense sense of urgency because I believe the stakes in this market are astonishingly high. They are, they are, are incredibly high and that most people are not thinking carefully about the lark, likely impact of the blockchain ecosystem growth. People are, not just, people are just generally not good at thinking about scale, right? But when technology ecosystems enter that mainstream adoption phase, the numbers are really huge. The average growth rate for the network equipment industry between 1995 and 2015, right, 20 years was 31% a year, right? Cloud computing has been growing at around 30% a year since 2008. That's just when I could get the data. Smartphones had about 15 years of 22, 23% a year growth, and that came after millions and millions of people already had not so smartphones. When I sort of average those together, you get about a 15 year cycle with an average growth rate of 27% a year. And by the way, whatever you have in year one, 15 years later, it will be 36 times larger. And it's worth taking a moment to think about what does 30 some times larger look like? Well, blockchain market cap means $3 trillion today. Well maybe less, I've been keeping track of the rate at which the market's going down to 108 trillion in 2037. Average daily decentralized exchange volume, $4 billion a day to $135 billion a day, right? Exchange revenues, we look at the revenues of the top uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, they're about $40 billion a year today. That implies a revenue state in 2037 of $1.3 trillion a year. Now you might be thinking to yourself, that's crazy. But is it? That's about the revenues of the world's top 10 banks combined, right? And the world's top 10 banks have a relatively small share of the global banking market, right? These numbers kind of seem enormous, but that's also my point. They are enormous and they're not unrealistic. I just took the average growth rate for three other major technology adoption periods. So one, the stakes are really big, but number two, stakes are really big. Number two, and I think even more importantly, it's not a market in which you can participate at your leisure. This is not like, hey, I'll get into it when it's the right size, right? Because the other kind of really big lesson from history is that market leaders don't change all that often, right? Enterprise networking equipment kind of, I would say started in maybe 1976 with the X.25 standard, but it was the mid nineties when enterprises started putting in ethernet networks and other types of networks. By the way, one company has been the market leader since 95. Personal computing, one company has run the, the, the PC uh, uh, marketplace since 1985, right? The same company, uh, they surpassed their VisiCalc and Lotus 123 and WordPerfect competition in, in 1993 and have been on top of that market ever since, right? I don't wanna drain the whole slide here, but my point is simple. When you get on top of one of these high growth markets, the odds are good that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, you will still be on top of that market. And what that also means is that you don't have the luxury of waiting two or three years to see where things will go. So if at EY, you are wondering why Paul, everything seems to be good. Why is Paul running around in a panic? It's because I feel a sense of urgency around every piece of this market. And I hope I can try to both impart to you my enthusiasm, my optimism and my sense of urgency as well. And with that, that brings me to the end of my presentation, right? This QR code on the screen is my contact information.